All right. Welcome, everyone, to today's Google Webmaster Central Office Hours Hangouts. Um, I'm going to mute some of you because of some background noise. Um, as always, I'd like to give a chance to those who are kind of new to these Hangouts to, to ask the first questions. If there's anything on your mind uh, that you'd like to talk about, feel free to speak up. Um, I'm not so new, but I haven't asked a question in quite some time. All right. Uh, this is actually an AMP-related question. Uh, so um, maybe if you remember, we worked with the uh, automotive news and reviews publisher. And um, we're planning to migrate to WordPress. And there's that AMP uh, plugin for WordPress that works mostly on posts, not pages. Uh, I don't know if you know that difference. Uh, anyway, what we're trying to do uh, is so that we keep most of the signals when they publish a new review of a model of a car, uh, to keep most of the signals to the same URL, we're going to uh, use a rel canonical from the latest review of that model to the model's main page, so that we kind of, you know, hoard the signals to the uh, model's uh, URL. So when it, somebody searches for 2017 model, uh, review, they go to that, um, you know, they get the main model page. 2018, we just update the canonical, and so on and so on. Uh, the problem is the AMP plugin, as I said, only works for posts. So I'm not sure what would happen with the post that has an AMP page, but the original post has a canonical to another page, but the AMP has a canonical to the post page. So it's like a canonical that goes to another canonical. Do you have any idea how it, that would work? We would probably drop that link. So we would probably follow the canonical to the post page and index that page the, the way that it is, as, as the normal desktop canonical, essentially. And on there, we probably wouldn't see the AMP HTML link pointing at the AMP page. So we'd probably lose the AMP page there. But this is, as far as I know, an open source plugin. So you could just fix the plugin. And uh, then it would work for you and maybe other people as well. Right. I mean, um, because the canonical is a Google thing, so the plugin doesn't work on that. Well, I mean, what you could do is, uh, is make the AMP plugin work for uh, pages as well, in addition wow. to uh, it's actually a taxonomy, so it's the model category page, which is the model main page, that lists the full content of the last review that has a canonical to the page, that taxonomy. So that would be a taxonomy AMP page needed to be created within the plugin or something like that. Yeah. So definitely, there's a, two, uh, a chain of two canonicals, uh, the, the AMP wouldn't the Google wouldn't pick up the AMP URL. I mean, we, we might temporarily pick it up uh, before we we pick the, the main page as the canonical for, for indexing. But uh, it would probably drop out fairly quickly, because the, the preferred canonical in that case would be the, the page, uh, which wouldn't have the AMP HTML link on it. So we wouldn't, we would kind of like lose that connection. Uh, could I fix it by just from so from that taxonomy page, always have the AMP um, AMP tag to the you know latest review like I do with the canonical, and then have like the indirect canonical back. Uh, Maybe. Yeah. I mean, if you can make if you can make the link to the AMP HTML page and from the AMP HTML page to your preferred canonical. That would be essentially a, a clean fix. Uh, doing it indirect in that the AMP HTML has a canonical to the post, and then the post has a canonical back to the page. I suspect that would mostly work, but not always. It's, it's kind of one of those weird edge cases. OK, so, so I'll, it's best I test it out, I guess, and see if the easiest yeah. variant works. If not, I'll just go for the Regarding I, I think especially with, with AMP pages, you'd want to keep it as simple as possible so that 
when we don't show them, it's easy for you to double check what, what's happening there. Whereas if there's like this level of indirection there, then if we don't show them in search, is it because of your indirection, or is there something else on the AMP page that's not working well, or are our systems just not picking that AMP page for whatever reason? So the, the easier you can make it, I think the, that's kind of what I'd aim for. Regarding the nice question, like the plugin, like the GitHub is the only plugin we should trust. I mean, there's also other plugins that kind of let you add all the codes and also add the analytics so you can see and all that stuff. Should we only trust the uh, AMP plugin? You, you can use them both. I, I think there are two main main plugins. I don't know what the development status is of, of both of them. I know one of them is, I think, the, the official one from WordPress. Um, I assume they're on top of these type of things, but uh, they, they're they usually pretty responsive. So that's kind of what, what I'd start with. But if you notice that the, the type of things you're trying to do are so special that they wouldn't make sense in a generic WordPress plugin, then maybe it makes sense to either fork that or to pick one of the other plugins and try that. Yeah, sure. No, just different ones let you uh, adjust color and uh, change the lo and add your logo and different kind of stuff, so that's why. Yeah, but I, I don't know. I assume there will be more more AMP plugins over time. But it's open source, so we can I can contribute yeah. to that, too. Sure. OK. Uh, John, when you're referring to uh, like testing it to see if it works or not, are you referring to both the carousel and the normal results? Or it doesn't matter. It should appear in both generic. So with regards to testing, I primarily use the testing tools to, to double check. I, I assume there will be more more AMP plugins over time. Don, you have a, a YouTube player somewhere in the background. <laughs> Echo. Um, yeah, so I I primarily test this in the testing tools. To, to see if it's technically correct. And uh, then at, at a second stage, when it's had time to be indexed, then that's something I try out uh, in, in the search results. So in this case, you could try the, the carousel if you have news content and you provide the, the article structure data markup that's required for that. Uh, or you could just try the, the new AMP demo with that special link and see how it shows up there. OK, OK, we'll do it. Thanks. All right, let me run through some of the submitted questions, and then we'll open it up to more questions from you all as well. Um, as always, if you have any comments or questions uh, along the way, feel free to, to jump on in. Um, will we see a confirmed dish then confirmed algorithm update that could be noticeable by everyone in the near future? So this is, I suspect, a tricky question. It's like, will we see any visible changes in the near future? And the answer is probably, because our engineers are always working on uh, improving search quality. So I think it's, it's kind of a, a tricky situation in that, of, of course, we make changes in our, to our search results. And some of these we'll be able to announce. Some of them we won't be able to announce. Uh, it goes on. I suspect the Panda hit uh, since the January core out update. Uh, we do a lot of work, and seeing almost no positive changes is frustrating. Um, Panda is something that's kind of continuously rolling out, so that's not something where I'd say we, we would call this out specifically, because it's essentially always moving. There's no like defined point where we can say, well, now it's like happening again, because it's not, not set up like that. Um, whoops. Let's see. Uh, do you know any websites that heavily affected by Panda, positively or negative, after it is integrated in the core algorithm? I mean, is there any chance that Panda rolled out has not completed yet in eight months, uh, since we have not seen a Panda refresh since January? Uh, again, this is something you, you wouldn't necessarily see, because this is kind of like a, a smooth rolling al algorithm. It's not something that would have well-defined edge points that you would really see. Um, I have a page that was rising in the search results for three months, got, got 1,000 plus visitors per day from Google for about seven days, was ranking second for a query for about a month, 
and then dropped, and the traffic is 75 instead of 900 a day. Uh, is that Panda or low quality algorithm? Um, it's really hard to say. My suspicion is that this is essentially just our algorithms trying to figure out where to place your website. And some of this uh, will change over time, where maybe user behavior is changing a little bit, and that people are searching for more for this and looking for more newsworthy content, and maybe. At that point, it makes sense to show your site. Um, maybe people are changing a bit now and looking more uh, for the evergreen type content, more reference material. And then maybe it makes sense to show your site or someone else's site. So these are things that are always changing. So when it comes to search, fluctuations are normal. You'll always see some up and down. And you will see long, longer term changes as well, where sometimes more people will go to a site through search, sometimes fewer people. Uh, that's essentially normal and not something where I'd say there's this one flaw on your website, which is why this is happening. Uh, of course, if you look at your website or if you take users and they look at your website for you and you say, well, there are these problems with my website or maybe it's not really fantastic or really great, then those are things I would work on regardless of any change like this. Uh, a client's website has a lot of links in the footer to most of the main pages uh, that also appear in the top navigation and in the left menu. Do you think this is really needed, and would it benefit or harm the site if we remove them? So probably these are links that we're already ignoring. If we already have links to that content through the normal navigation, then there's no need to kind of provide them again in the footer. Usually what happens in, in cases like this I, I don't know if this is really the situation here, but uh, a lot of sites, or some sites, used to do that in that they would put like really small text and uh, keyword-rich anchor text uh, links into the footer of their pages, leading to lower-level pages on their website. And from our point of view, that was mostly seen as keyword stuffing, where algorithms are looking at your pages and saying, oh, all these keywords are unrelated to the actual content on this page. Therefore, we'll ignore them. So Probably, depending on the site, we've been ignoring those links anyway. And uh, if you're doing a revamp of your website, then it doesn't make sense to spend time to kind of keep maintaining those, those extra links that are not being used anyway. Um, are PDF files good or bad from Google search and user experience uh, perspective? Bearing in mind that not mobile friendly and some older versions of Android mobile phones have a problem downloading PDFs when on a site that uses SSL. Uh, what are your recommendations? So I don't know why, but uh, I've been seeing a bunch of questions around PDFs recently. Uh, in general, we can do pretty good with PDFs. When uh, we can pick up the content there, we, that's something that we can usually show in search results. Um, there are some situations where users explicitly search for these kind of forms that, that they can print out, for example, or documentation uh, to print out and study. So that's something, if you have this type of content on your site, I wouldn't necessarily hide it from search engines. Uh, of course, when you're comparing normal website with the PDF version of exactly the same content, probably we'll tend to show the normal, normal website more because it's just easier for us to pick up the content there. And we know that users can kind of uh, get along within your website and understand uh, what they can do there. Um, so if it's uh, exactly the same content that you're already showing on your website, Maybe it's not worth uh, spending extra time on creating PDFs for that. But if these are unique pages, documents that you're providing on PDF that you don't really have in the same way or in the same kind of printable fashion uh, within your normal website, then I would definitely keep those and keep linking to those within your website uh, because those are things that uh, people can still pick up on. Uh, John, can I ask a question regarding that? Uh, sure. So or what if, for example, we're working with a university and they have like empty pages that just link to you know, useful PDFs for students, for example? Uh, so a PDF would be like the curriculum. Uh, would it be advised to maybe use a portion of that content on the page and then link for further information to the curriculum so would that be you know, can have a call to action and, and maybe set a real canonical from the PDF to that page? Maybe. Sure. 
uh, that's that's something I I test out. I, I think that really depends on what users are trying to do. Um, for example, if you're searching for a tax form, then you don't really want a document on the tax website about that tax form. You just want the tax form. You just want to go there directly. Um, but other cases, you want that information, and uh, the format itself is not so important. So in, in a case like that, maybe putting that on the web page as well is a good idea. Um, in other cases, maybe just keeping it in the PDF is, is fine as well. But this is something that's easy to test out and to, to kind of see how people kind of interact with, with the content, what they click on in the search results, um, how those pages rank, how, how it kind of works for you. So that's something I just test. So the canonical on the PDF is something that Google would take into consideration? Yeah. So I, th I think you mean like setting the canonical from the PDF to the web version? Is it that? Um, you, you could do that, yeah. I, I mean, that would essentially um, kind of help us to forward the signals that we have for that PDF to the web page. And we would expect that these pages would be kind of equivalent in the sense that uh, they provide the same information. Yeah, OK. All right. Uh, if you were to add a social feed on a website, would Google crawl the text from the feed? And would this have any effect on the search engines? Um, so I assume this is not about creating an RSS feed for a blog, for example, uh, but rather that you're taking a feed from Twitter or from somewhere else, and you're republishing that on your website. Uh, in a case like that, what would probably happen is we would process the JavaScript or whatever method you're using to integrate this content into your site, um, pull in that content, and treat that as a part of your page as well. And we would use that and take that into account for, for ranking purposes as well. So essentially, we would see whatever you're displaying on your web page as a part of your page and try to use that uh, for, for ranking. And that can have positive or negative effects. If you want people to, to go to your pages because of this content, that could, could have a positive effect. On the other hand, if your content is primarily just based on this feed that you're pulling in from somewhere else, then it would also look to, to us like you're just republishing content from somewhere else. And that's not necessarily the best user experience. That's not necessarily what our algorithms are looking for. So our algorithms might say, well, why should we focus on this website when it's actually just republishing content from somewhere else? So you really need to make sure that you're providing additional value, that you're providing something unique, compelling, uh, and valuable on its own uh, within your website. And if these social feeds that you're adding to your pages like that provide extra value, then sure, why, why not go for that? But the thing is, though, if somebody's writing, how much is this uh, CEO making, like, let's say, a news article, and the other guy wrote about this one as well, or let's take uh, an example like Pokemon Go, and then uh, three people wrote about this particular, because it's so hot, but what if each one is unique, right? Just like having a conversation here, and each one is saying something different. Um, I mean, so what does your algorithm do in this case? Like if, if you're if, aggregating well, content from other people, other unique. No, no, no. I mean, maybe you can just not not. Uh, you, you're not actually, God forbid, spinning the article. You're you're making it as high as quality as possible. Should should be fun, right? You're talking about just like rewriting the article, republishing it the way it is, or uh, redoing the article. Yeah, I, I think those are important questions to to kind of ask yourself. So that's something where. Really, you need to make sure that you're providing the value on your side. So if you're taking, in, in this example, a, a feed from somewhere else, and you're just republishing that, and that's the only valuable part of your website, then that's something where yeah, you look at and say, yeah. why, why are we spending time crawling and indexing this site? For sure, yeah. But uh, if you're providing something really valuable on your website, and you kind of have like a news ticker in the sidebar or something like that, where you're pulling in a feed from uh, news or from social media, and that's kind of like additional value on your pages, then sure, that's that's not something I'd say would be problematic. What about uh, sites that are taking your news, uh, a specific news page, and then they're, they're just they're going out there and then kind of republishing that? I mean, is that something that you send uh, the spam team? Uh... Sometimes, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's, 
That's, I mean, we, our algorithms try to pick that up automatically anyway, but uh, sometimes it makes sense to, to send these to the spam people to the, submit a spam report for something like that. Sounds good. Thanks. Uh, sometimes fetch and render reports that some static content on my pages, like CSS and GIF files, are temporarily unreachable for Googlebot. The output is perfect for the visitor display. I try again, and this time no error reports. The server is OK. Is this a bug? Um, it's probably not a bug. It's probably either a system on our side or on your side that's slightly overloaded and just didn't have time to pull up all of this content. So particularly with pages that have a lot of in embedded content, we need to go off and fetch all of these embedded files and use those to render those pages. And that's something that sometimes takes quite a bit of time, and our systems want to give you a result in a reasonably short time. So what might be happening there is either on our side or on your side, things are timing out. And we're just not able to render that page immediately for you to, to try things out. We, we do try to cache embedded content for, for some time, um, in particular when we render on our side, uh, to save some of the load on your server. So that's something where you might see this, this effect where you test it once, and it says temporarily unreachable, and you just refresh it again, and then suddenly it works. So that's something where we're probably picking up some of the embedded content from our cache and just able to focus on those elements that didn't make it last time. Uh, one of my top performing pages with 9,000 pages remain intact. Uh, was it some kind of panda demotion for one page only? Uh, what can I do? So this is kind of similar to the, the previous question I think you placed uh, in that fluctuations can happen. Things can change on our side. Things can change on the web in general. Things can change with the way that users search and what they expect from the search results. So that's something where I wouldn't necessarily say it's, it's a problem on your side that suddenly there are fewer people going to your pages. Maybe this is a normal development. Uh, for, for example, if you have a page about certain Olympic sports, then obviously during the Olympics you'll see a ton of traffic, but afterwards you won't see that much traffic. So that's the, the kind of change where I'd say, in general, this is, is a natural change. Um, of course, if you're looking at your pages and you're saying, well, these aren't really that great, or they have a ton of ads on them, or they're just not that unique, then that's something that you can obviously fix. And that does help our quality algorithms to better understand your page and to better say, well, this is a really good page. We should be showing it more, actually, in the search results. Um, link to it's relevant to the topic of my pages rank and compete for the same queries in the top 10. Uh, does that reduce user engagement data for my page? Can linking out uh, from the web uh, reduce user behavior data? So in general, I'm not really sure of what, what you're kind of uh, thinking about when it comes to user engagement data. Uh, that's generally not something we would take into account for search search features. Uh, in particular, we wouldn't use things like analytics for, for search, for rankings at all. Um, so I'm not really sure what what you're looking at there. In general, my, my recommendation is to, to link to pages that you think provide extra value for your users, because that link is also valuable for, for users. So if you think it makes sense to, to guide users to that other piece of content, be it on your website or on another website, if it makes sense to kind of connect those two, then that's something I, I would do. That, provides extra value for users. And over time, that's something that our systems might be able to pick up on and say, well, this is something valuable for our site uh, to show in search as well. Um, Google has been tampering a lot with our homepage titles for exact match query, site name plus country. Uh, it's a multi-site WordPress installation with localized versions in English, UK, and Brazil, I imagine. Uh, what should we be looking at? 
Um, it's hard to say with, uh, without specific examples of what might be happening there. Uh, when, when you mention multi-site installations and uh, multiple English versions, my feeling is that maybe you're running into a situation where we think these pages are is essentially is identical and that we could theoretically fold them together and just keep one of these pages and index them like that. So that's something I try to double check for in the sense of uh, are these pages really unique? Should they be ranking separately? Uh, if they should be ranking separately, then what, what's happening with the titles here? I'd make sure that there's the hreflang connection between these pages so that we understand that these are unique pages on their own. Uh, but that they're connected in the sense that this is an equivalent for Brazil and this is maybe the equivalent page for the UK. Um, I'd also make sure that you're picking an X default page for, for that set. Uh, specifically, if you just have UK and Brazil, then there are lots of other countries that people might be searching from, uh, which might also want to, to find your website in the search results. And if you don't define an X default, then it might be hit and miss which one we actually show, the UK version or the Brazil version. So that's that's something you might want to watch out for. Um, the other thing, I guess, uh, if you're noticing that the titles which we're generating are really bad and not useful at all for your users, then I definitely send that uh, to us. You could send that to me by Google Plus directly, for example. Uh, I tend to forward these to the titles team here, and they're pretty good at taking these into account with future algorithm updates. So you might not see immediate changes in the search results. Whoops, somehow that logged me out. OK. <laughs> uh, you might not see immediate changes in the search results uh, when you submit these things uh, to me. Uh, but the title team does take this feedback seriously and tries to figure out what it can do to resolve this problem on an algorithmic level. John, uh, the question regarding the geo-targeting in the, in the Webmaster tools. So there's an option there for US and Canada. But suppose, because we're next door neighbors, and uh, I was just wondering, if a website is a .com, instead of creating the whole a .ca, it's just a waste of time. I was wondering, would you guys ever consider uh, considering adding an option Canada and then Canada and the U.S. so we can target it in both Canada and U.S.? Do you know what I mean? Like, so have you uh, United States, Canada, and then Canada and United States? I, I think you'd have to solve that on a political level first. Um, but yeah, hey, uh, just uh, call. I, I don't know. Like, like maybe in, in the upcoming elections, you could have Canada like also be one of the people that, that can be elected as president. Maybe that, that would be a solution. I, <laughs> I, I can't really speak for that. But anyways, no, no just a... Uh, uh, I, I think... Without being facetious here. Yeah. I, it, it's, it's a tricky problem. Uh, I mean, we have that in Europe as well, where there are multiple German-speaking countries. Right. And you, you kind of want to target all of them, uh, but you don't want to create separate sites for them, which, which exactly, is understandable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, from, from our point of view, what you would do in a case like that is just write your content in that language and not use geotargeting at all. Okay. Um, that's, that's an option you could do in a case like this, which essentially would just say, well, I don't have any specific geotargeting set. Uh, yeah, like Mihai says, you can set it to unlisted, which essentially tells us, I don't even want Google to guess at my geotargeting. I just don't want to use geotargeting, which, okay. which might be an option that you could do there. If you just don't select one in Search Console, then our systems will try to guess and figure out which one you do want to target and do that. Um, in practice, it probably doesn't make a big difference if you use like Canada or UK, uh, Canada or US uh, for, for geotargeting there. Maybe it makes it easier for you to pick the, the one that you're, you're having more trouble ranking in. Okay. Uh, that, that might be an option. But uh, I, I don't see it happening that we would have regions uh, for geotargeting, where you could say, I want to target all of Europe or all of Southeast Asia or all of North America in, in your case. Right. I, I don't see that happening. But Bot is uh, very clever. He'll understand eventually, right? Like that. U.S., Canada, kind of like the... Yeah. Okay. 
I, I mean, that, that's something where you as an SEO probably want to make that decision for the bot as much as possible. Sure. Um, I, I'm sure we, we figure it out in most cases, but if you have an, an opinion on which, which of these countries you want to target or if you don't want to use geotargeting at all, then I definitely give us that, that information. So that's something where usually we'll try to figure it out anyway, but if you already know how all of this works, you might as well tell us what your preference is. Thanks. John, can I follow up on the one that you had before about the, um, the titles? Sure. Uh, has anything changed in that, in those, the way you treat those recently or the behavior? Because I've noticed over the last three or four months that Google is um, guessing a lot more rather than using what we suggest so that we see within the snippets we see a lot of variation now whereas it used to be it was just always our meta info. Uh, so that's the, the snippet or the title or both? Both. Main, mainly the description but, okay. but a bit of both. And not just us, other things we look at regularly we've noticed you uh, doing your own thing rather than trusting what Meta Info says. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I mean, the team is, is still alive and they're still working, so I, I'm, assured, I'm sure they're doing some changes, but I, I don't know of anything specific that's been happening recently. I mean, if you, if you run across these situations, I, I'd love to have that because that's always useful for the team. Um, I noticed that usually we're a lot better in English and maybe not so great in other languages, but it sounds like in your case, this is probably English content as well. Yeah. Um, one, one thing to kind of watch out for when you're testing for titles and snippets is that you use the actual queries that users use, so you don't just do a site query, but actually like search right. for your keywords. Okay. Because we, we do adjust the titles and the descriptions a bit uh, based on the query itself. So if you're just doing a site query, then probably we'll show something generic. Uh, if you search for your site query and then the keywords, then probably we'll try to adjust that uh, title and snippet based on those keywords. Uh, John, regarding the site query, so if you do this search, you'll see that the negative site operator doesn't really work because on the first page of results you can see a .edu site. So is it just that negative operators don't function the same, I guess, or...? I don't know. I, I'd have to double check what, what's happening in the background there. So mm -hmm. I, I don't really have any, any in-depth insight on, on that specific query. I think it's, it's a tricky one because you're doing a negative site for the whole TLD, uh, which might be that we're trying to balance that out and saying, well, actually, the results match mostly for other sites on that TLD. Uh, so we're trying to kind of like give it a little bit of weight, but not uh, like full weight. I, I don't know in, in this specific case. I'd, I'd have to double check. Uh, in general, I think the, the negative site queries are, are kind of tricky because it's, it's not something where uh, when we go to the engineers and say, well, this, this type of query isn't working perfectly as you would expect, they, they probably say, well, nobody else except for this Mihai guy ever does this query. Um, I don't know if it's worth actually spending a lot of engineering time on trying to figure out what's happening here and to, to change or to fix uh, whatever that behavior is. Some, sometimes they, they do point at more general issues, though. So that's, that's something that's always valuable. So I, I still like to pass those on to the team, because sometimes they'll look at that and say, oh, in this specific case, it's very obvious. But in a lot of other cases, it's not so obvious that we're actually getting it wrong. So that's always useful to have. OK, well, I just noticed this, so you got to pass it along. Cool. Thanks. Um, a new Panda or similar update was probably released in June, and our site has been hit hard. What's puzzling us is that uh, the very same URLs that have been hit by the update have disappeared from the internal links panel in Search Console. What's up with that? Um, 
I don't think you'd probably be seeing a big change from Panda because this is something that's more uh, generally rolling out. Uh, so that's probably not what you're seeing there. Christina. Yes, uh, this would be Fabrizio's question. Is that it? Uh, his site seems to be crossed with another site. The web cache of his home page is crossed with another uh, from somewhat of a similar site, but nowhere as um, involved as his. I did not notice what could possibly do that. Uh, he's on a dedicated IP, the only site on his server, so it shouldn't be an issue with um, SSL certs on um, shared hosting. So I was wondering if perhaps the other side had at some point done a 302 redirection to his own. Uh, the cache is recent, like from yesterday or the day before. So it's kind of funny. Right now it's not redirecting, so I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, did he post the URL in the... Yeah, uh, I, will, I will find you the... Um, the forum post oh, okay. where it is. So this is uh, from the forum. Okay, great. If you can send me the... I'll find it in a moment. Um, I, I can double check that. Yeah. I, I think that's something that's probably more likely here in a case like this. So uh, like I mentioned, the Panda updates, they're more like subtly rolling. You wouldn't see a big change from one day to the next. And especially if you're saying that uh, some of the URLs have disappeared from some of the tools, within Search Console, then that would point more towards like a technical issue, an indexing type issue, uh, something that's probably easier to fix once it's clearly recognized what it actually is. Um, but uh, I'd probably have to look at the exact URLs there. So uh, if Christina can send me those links afterwards, that would, that would be fantastic. Getting there as soon as I can get back here. OK, forum post, forum thread here. And I'll find the uh, URL as well. Okay. Yeah, I probably have to take a look at that after the Hangout. Because okay. there, there are so many weird things to kind of yeah. click through and figure out. Sure. Oh. And Fabrizio is, is here somewhere. He was supposed to try to join, but I guess he may have gotten his hours wrong. I, I just saw he added another question, so he's... He's somewhere I think it's on the, the internet. Same question. He's watching us. We will figure it out, Fabrizio. I, I'll take a look at the forum thread. Yes. Um, if you have a bunch of images that people love to share and use, etc., and you invite them to hotlink these images instead of copying them to their own sites, uh, would this have any SEO benefit? So I think the biggest effect you would see there is that uh, we would try to use those pages and those images uh, in image search. So specifically for image search, we take the landing page of the image into account, uh, specifically with regards to understanding what this image is about. And we may rank that combination of that landing page and your image file in image search. So one extreme situation that uh, we sometimes run across is a photographer that puts an, an image on their site, and essentially it's an empty page with like DSC and some number .jpg as the title and the only text on the page. And someone else takes that image, puts it into a forum post, and has a, a long discussion about that image or about something that's similar to that image. Then, of course, for us, when someone is searching for a text, we find a lot more information on that forum post than we would find on that uh, photographer's landing page. And we might use that forum post as the landing page associated for image search. So that's something where you might see th this kind of effect. That doesn't necessarily mean that your website, where this image uh, is originally hosted, has a, a kind of a SEO boost because of that. But uh, people may be able to see your image more because we have more context about your image, and we can pull that context in with regards to ranking in image search. Um, I've added breadcrumbs markup to about a million pages on our site. And yet for about a month now, the structured data report is stuck at 140,000. Now when I crawl the site with Screaming Frog, I find them all. Uh, do you have any idea why Search Console is so slow? Um, 
you're here, right? Yeah. I'm All right. Here. Perfect. Um, so I. I'd have to double check on this, but uh, I, I think what's probably happening is we're just uh, crawling and indexing at our normal rates. And that does sometimes mean that it takes several months for us to crawl and index the whole content of, of a larger website. So that's something where we probably pick up a lot of pages fairly quickly, and then it, the, the, the scheduling of these URLs kind of takes a while, and it just takes several months for us to actually pick up the rest of the content there. So Even if a site is getting crawled at a rate of four or five hundred pages per day, four or five hundred thousand pages per day. Um, potentially, I'd I'd have to take a look at what actually is happening there. So that's. Okay, well, I've sent you a message. Okay. Yeah. If if you have the URL, that that would be really useful, and I can take a look at that. Uh, the one thing I do know is the index status report in Search Console has been stuck for a couple of weeks now. So if you're looking at that, you probably see the same number, but that shouldn't affect the structured data report. I think the structured data report should still be picking these up. Okay. But we'll wait. Uh, in this case, it sounds like maybe we're not picking it up as quickly as we should. John, John. Right, you look John? This, right? John, hello. Yes. Yes. Can I just can I just quickly jump in on that because uh, um. It's actually related. So it's a question about scheduling. Yeah, if this is all right. Sure. Um, have, you, have you finished, John? Or is, that, is it all right? If I that was there? my question. Go ahead, Don. So I was reading, you know, I'm quite interested in scheduling. Yeah, but I was reading some stuff about scheduling um, the other day. And one of the things that I noticed is. Um, Obviously, there's very drivers behind it, but something that was peculiar that I'd never seen mentioned before was um, in a in a document that was around smart crawling, if you like, that was from around 2014, around the time I think that I think Matt said something around um, um, something to do with the news. Uh, it modified. It was kind of around that same sort of time, and one of the things that was pointed to in this document was that um, number of the number of impressions a, a, a page triggers seemed to be a factor. Now, around that time, I remember watching a Google Webmaster Hangout, and you'd said, I wouldn't really bother too much with pages that have a search volume below, say, 10 searches a month. And I wondered if perhaps a page that triggers loads of impressions, i.e., because obviously, presumably, it's content rich, etc., and Increasingly important because there's a high probability that somebody's going to be seeing it. Wasn't it was a, a factor really in, in crawling? How much page is going to get? Yeah, I I don't know if there is a direct relationship there. I I suspect there. Whoops, I I suspect there is a, a lot of indirect linking there in the sense that uh, pages that show up frequently in the search results tend to be more important pages. And the more important pages are the type of things that we would crawl a little bit more frequently. Um, but just because it's seeing more impressions doesn't necessarily mean that we would take that and uh, use that for scheduling. So, but it, so it's kind of more of a co correlation than a causation, in effect. Probably, yeah. Yeah, because this document kind of said, look, you know, there's no point really in crawling pages from an efficiency perspective if nobody's actually looking for them in the first place. That kind of makes sense, yeah. I mean, especially when you're looking at uh, the, the really long tail of a website, then these are also pages that tend not to change that frequently. Uh, if you're that, looking... Sorry, go on. If you're looking at some archive of a news site that's like going back to the 1800s, then these are things that don't make sense to crawl every day because they're they're just not changing that frequently. So that's kind of the the thing where when we look at that, we probably say, well, this content isn't changing that often. It doesn't really make sense to crawl that frequently. But that could actually be on a massive website. That could actually to be a product page or many thousands of product pages that literally don't change very often actually add when you combine all the 
fewer than, fewer than 10 queries. So say for instance somebody does a massive migration, it might take several months before eventually, because those pages are just not that important as such, they don't get crawled. And that might be part of the answer to Jano's question effectively. Yeah, I mean, that's that's completely normal. Like some pages we crawl several times a day, some pages every couple of days, some, I don't know, weeks to, to months where I'd, I'd say it can happen that we crawl some pages once a year just because we, we think it's not really worth uh, the effort to, to kind of dig in to that every time to, to actually pick that up. But I, I wouldn't tie that to like, I don't know, any specific number of impressions. I, I think that's just the, the normal website structure. And some websites are more more flat in the sense that, that all of their pages kind of change fairly frequently, and others really have this, this kind of head and tail situation where we say, well, these are really important pages that change really, really quickly, and all of this stuff back here really changes, like, rarely, mm -hmm. if, if ever. So if you take news websites, for example, then like the main headline pages are the things that we need to crawl like every couple of minutes to actually keep up. But once it kind of moves into an archive, then we don't need to look at it ever again, essentially. So if somebody was migrating that massive news website across to, say, a new domain for whatever reason, or even to HTTPS, that actually could have an impact over time. You know, we talked the other week about the shuffling and the kind of how it takes quite a long time sometimes for everything to get passed across, that potentially could have an impact if something's from an archive from like 10 years ago. It's probably not going to get the crawl that sure, the home yeah. page of I mean, news the, websites didn't get. That's, that's essentially a normal part of a site migration where, where some things go faster, some things take a little bit longer. Uh, we do try to recognize situations where we see a site is migrating and kind of speed things up a little bit to, to get things moving there. So that's, that's something where if you do a site query for an old domain, you'll probably see a lot of the, the old content for quite some time. In addition to us thinking, well, you're probably looking for that domain, therefore we'll show you content from that domain. So that's, that's the kind of situation where you, you kind of expect things to, to take a while to migrate. But especially when you're moving to HTTPS or when you're doing other site moves like that, uh, if you have redirect set up, that's not something that would be negatively affecting you because users can still click on the old result and actually make it to, to the current result. So that's not something where I'd say you'd, you'd have any problems because of this kind of uh, staged uh, migration. Rankings might all the signals get crawled eventually over time. So I just remember reading something as well about um, a site that migrated and they'd no indexed a load of a big section on old site and had actually then passed across that when they migrated to the new domain. And in actual fact, even though the no index there. Um, it actually had passed something, and the other week, um, um, Gary was in a, a hangout or some sort of pro web promo thing with Eric Eng, and Gary said there's no dissipation, and no index stuff off page. So it would have passed something maybe years ago, but now when it migrates, because the no index wasn't included, potentially it's lost. Is that right? Well, sure. I mean, if you make changes on your website, like no index or not no index, those are pretty big changes. So that's that's, that's something where it would be normal to, to see that reflected in the search results. Okay. Right, thanks for that. Sorry, uh, I'm gone now. Okay. Oh, thank, thanks, John. Cheers. Sure. All right, we have five minutes left. Who wants to grab some time? So, <laughs> I don't know. Go ahead. But I, I could finally join the conversation. I couldn't understand how to join you guys. So this is my first time here. Well, and uh, great to have you. Thank you. Uh, glad to be here. Um, yeah, I, I wanted just to follow up about what Christina was saying about my website. And uh, I can provide, I, I don't know how. I, I, I wrote in one of the questions my URL Christina was talking about. Um, 
I, I probably need to take a look at that afterwards. So okay. I, I think uh, Christina linked to the, the forum thread, and I, I can add something there. Okay, great. When I have Perfect. Time to, great. To dig into Wonderful. What is actually happening there? All right. That, that's good enough. Thank you. All right. John, John. Yes. Can I have a question as well? Go for it. So we all know that Google has the penguin and so on. But uh, what is Google doing at the moment in regard to picking up the paid links? How do you pick them? Since penguin, it takes that long to, to be run again and again and so on. <clears throat> because, yeah. for instance, we are operating within the UK market, right? Mm -hmm. And one of our competitors, which is overperforming, has a lot, a lot of uh, unnatural links. And my question was rather, okay, I will submit one, let's say, comp uh, I will file a complaint to, to Google Web Swan team, mm -hmm. but what shall I do so that the guys over there will prioritize that complaint so, so that they can take a look at it because it's it's more than it's more than obvious and if you want we can take together a look at some examples that they are really spamming and paying for a lot of backlinks and so on. So what is Google doing in between penguins? Uh, we we do have other algorithms as well that, that look at web spam like that. Uh, but we also have the manual web spam team that loves these kind of reports. So if you're submitting them with uh, the web spam report, that's one really good thing to do. Um, you could also, if this is a more complicated type of situation, um, if you can send me the information maybe in a, in a shared Google Doc or something for like instance, that. For instance, if you allow me, I'll send you a single, just a single example on the, hang on the chat. Probably easiest if you can send it to me by, by Google Plus. Uh, oh, that's right. That okay, I'll 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 make a, a short list, let's say, with such such examples, and I will send it to you so that you can take a look at it. Because okay. to be honest, to be honest with you, we did improve a lot of things, but they overperform because of those kind of strategies, and we we are really sitting and asking ourselves, okay, what shall we do next? <laughs> yeah. I know, I know these, these type of situations are always kind of frustrating because you, you see someone else doing something sneaky or spammy and you don't want to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. um, what, one thing that does sometimes happen is that our algorithms are already ignoring the spammy things that they're doing and they're ranking despite those spammy things. So sometimes we'll see a site that's actually a really good website but they're doing something really spammy and we try to rank it based on the the positive yeah, criteria. I know what you mean. I know what you mean, but it's not the case. <laughs> yeah. It's so not the I case because, to be honest with you, uh, they have dozens of backlinks, uh, uh, very uh, key or each ones on top uh, uh, websites, but it's visible from the moon that the backlinks are paid ones and unnatural ones because the topics don't match. Yeah. The, the the products that they sell anyway. So <laughs> okay. So if you can send me those examples, that would be fantastic. Is okay. it true? Yes. I I have to go, guys. Um, it's it's been great talking with all of you. Um, someone else needs this room, but uh, I I have some more hangouts set up, so we won't be going away for too long. Um, hopefully I'll see some of you again and uh, get some of your reports as well uh, to to help us improve the systems here. All right. Um, have a good day. Good evening, depending on your location. And you. see you next time. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, John. Bye. 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 Bye.